Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan. By the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment. And by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. So last week, uh, how many people were here last week? Wow, cool. So we don't even need to talk about half of this stuff. <laughs> we'll, we'll just, uh, uh, we talked about early lights and we talked about Fresnel an awful lot from the inception of his lens pretty much through the fruition of his design. And today we're gonna talk about the final improvements to his, to his apparatus. And that's really all, all we're going to discuss. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mercury, and we're going to talk a little bit about characteristics, because I didn't talk about that last week. We're going to talk about orders of lenses, because that seems to be a question that comes up a lot. And we're going to mention rotation speeds. Uh, I don't need to talk a lot about rotation speeds, because the wonderful display staff here has created this display for me. <coughs> I can't pay these people enough. <laughs> uh, when we're talking about lenses pre-mercury floats, ones that were all operated on by clockworks and rolled on chariot wheels, and we'll, we'll see pictures of all this, this is the speed that a lens rotated at. This is one revolution every eight to 10 minutes. So you just keep an eye on this guy, and every 10 minutes or so, It'll come around and you'll see a little flash. And that's, that's the speed that lens is rotated at. Uh, later on, after they perfected the mercury float, this is about the speed that they would rotate. Uh, the, fa the fastest one I have found uh, uh, gave, a, gave a flash just about, gave 18 flashes a minute. Now that's pretty darn quick. That's, that's give or take one flash every three and a half seconds. So that's amazing how quickly they could get these monster machines to rotate. And you'll see later on how big some of these machines got to be. The French called them faux éclair. Uh, it's a cute word, or a cute couple of words, and basically means light or brilliance of lightning. And uh, that's what these lenses were capable of doing in com when you compared them with their earlier ones. So what about mercury? That, that's, that's one of the key players in all of this. So let's talk about it for just a slide or two. What is mercury? Well, it's, it's a rock. It's a beautiful red rock, as a matter of fact. And, uh, and, this, and it comes out, it, the rock is cinnabar. This is, this is a little piece of cinnabar ore. After you melt it and, uh, and smelt it, I should say, uh, it ends up looking like it becomes this wonderful, silvery, heavy, liquid metal. <clears throat> the chemical symbol is HG for, for, all the, for all the chemistry people that already know that in here. It's, it's HG for the people that don't have, have a chemistry background, which comes from a Greek word, hydrargyrum. Blech, I hate saying that. Uh, which in, from the Greek means uh, hydra, liquid or watery, and gyrum, silver. So liquid silver, pretty simple stuff. Uh, the Romans, in turn, of course, could, couldn't, couldn't uh, accept any Greek words, so they had to come up with their own. And they named the material in honor of their fleet-footed messenger of their gods, Mercury, because he was so fast. And if any of you have ever spilled mercury and tried to pick it back up again, you will understand what I'm talking about when I talk about fast. It, it's uh, quite a trick to be able to pick that stuff back up once you dump it. Uh, the early Chinese used it in, uh, as an elixir. They actually would swallow the stuff. Uh, th and, and the problem is they thought it extended their lives. Uh, <laughs> They were wrong on that one. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, the ancient Greeks would rub it onto their skin as an ointment, thinking it, it was doing something good for them. Uh, the Romans, on the other hand, would, crush, would actually crush the cinnabar and rub, rub the red powder on their cheeks and on their lips for, as a coloring agent. And when you think about the fact that they had lead plumbing <laughs> and they were smearing mercury all over themselves, uh, the Romans had a real love affair with toxic metals. It's amazing that they ever conquered the world. Uh, the, me the metal's got a, an interesting uh, uh, attribute in that it's an amalgam and it loves to just devour other metals. Uh, put, put some gold in mercury and, and watch what happens, or silver, or uh, aluminum, and, uh, and you'll find out what, just exactly what that property is. Excuse me. And we're probably familiar with the modern use, more modern uses of it in barometers and thermometers and manometers and uh, obviously dentistry if you've got any fillings in your mouth and munitions. You can't fire a bullet with it without mercury. That's, it's really hard to do. So it's got a lot of uses. Uh, if you're as old as me, then you probably remember a bottle of mercurochrome in the, in the, in the uh, bathroom cabinet. That's mercury. It kills the bugs. So it's, it's really good stuff. So how did they get this stuff out of the ground? Well, they mined it the old-fashioned way, with slaves. And these guys would, uh, would go in there with their picks and their axes and shovels and, and take the rock out, out of the ground. The largest deposits of cinnabar in the Roman Empire were in Spain. And that's, uh, that's where mo most of their mercury came from. And in Rome, they were pretty smart individuals. They said, well, you know, uh, if we send our slaves over to the cinnabar mines, uh, we can send, get rid of all those nasty capital prisoners that we have, and uh, we'll get th about three years' worth of work out of them before they fall over dead. So it was kind of a slow execution. Uh, they already knew back in Roman times that this stuff was toxic. And, uh, and that's how the Romans did it. Uh, capital punishment was going to the cinnabar mines in Spain. Uh, it certainly is uh, a toxic material. Excuse me. I did something there. Uh, and if we have time toward, towards the end, we'll talk about how the hatter got mad. Being mad as a hatter, because that has to do strictly with mercury. So we talked last week about Fresnel uh, being the great inventor in his 1821 invention of the first, first uh, flashing lighthouse lens. Also though, on April the 19th, 1825, he wrote a letter. And in that letter, he, he wrote it to a, p a potential customer because he was, his, he, his company was in the business of uh, marketing these lenses. And he said, uh, I propose to float our rotating devices in, of the first order, which is obviously the big one, in a bath of mercury instead of putting it on those rollers, which are kind of slow. And he said, uh, the project doesn't present many difficulties in making that mercury bath a reality. Well, the guy was a bit of an optimist because it actually took another 65 years before the, the concept of the mercury float lens was converted into a reality. Uh, it's an engineering nightmare, and he was obviously a scientist and not an engineer, and it's sort of the architect structural engineer issue of let's, let's create something and then you figure out how to build it. And that, that's kind of what he did with, with, with the mercury float. And so it took a little while for, for a bunch of engineers to figure out how to actually make it work. So last week we did talk a lot about his lens, but again, we didn't talk much about the characteristics and the orders and, and that sort of thing. And uh, so first I'm just gonna just quickly go through what is, what is the order of a lens. Actually, there's two things about what is the order of a lens. Uh, the, this is a cross section through, through a bunch of lenses. It's obviously, this is the center line, so that you're only looking at, at the left half of the lens. 
This red line represents a, a six foot person stand, standing next to the lens. Okay, here's a first order lens. What makes it a first order? It's 36.22 inches from the backside of this glass, glass right at the center to the light source. Every first order lens in the world is 36.22 inches. It, it's, it's a rule, it has to be, that's what makes it a first order. Uh, second order obviously is a little closer, 27 and a half inches, all the way down to a sixth order, which is only five point, it's six inches, 5.9 inches. So a sixth order lens, the whole lens is only 12 inches across. They're really teeny, you can put them under your arm, take them home, and that's why they're the rarest lens in the world today, because everybody did put them under their arm and take them home, because they were cute. Uh, it's true, it's absolutely true. Uh, so that's what the, that's part of the, this is, this is the definition that Fresnel had when he established the orders. That, that's all it is, it's, it's, the, it's that uh, focal length uh, dimension. <coughs> And it, by the way, it does nothing to do with the height of the lens. It doesn't, the first order lens does not have to be this high. A first order lens can actually be this high and it's still a first order lens as long as it's got this distance. You don't need the, you don't have to have all this glass at the top and the bottom. It'll still make it a first order lens. Along with that, the, the, by the way, he had, he had his six orders uh, first, second, third through sixth. They found later on that that wasn't enough and by, by the end, by, by, the, by 1850, 1860, they had come up with 11 orders of lenses. Uh, the biggest being hyperradial, then a mesoradial, then the first, then a third and a half stuck between the third and the fourth, and a seventh and the eighth uh, stuck on at the end. The US never used seventh and eighth order lenses at all, uh, nor did they use a mesoradial for that matter. But, uh, but the, around the world, there were a lot of different sizes of these things. So what's the other part of the, of the order? Well, okay, you're all out in the Atlantic Ocean, and you're far enough out that you can't see the sea continental United States yet. I'll try to make this as simple as I can. Here's a cliff, and here are six lighthouses that are all built on the top of the cliff in, oh, let's say, Massachusetts, for, for no good reason. And all the lighthouses are the same, one side by side, one is made for a first order lens, which, which means the tower is really big in diameter to hold that great big lens up, all the way down to a fourth order tower with a fourth and a fifth and a sixth order lens on top of each one of those. Okay, you're sailing along across from, from say, Europe, and you crest over the horizon, so that now you, you're capable of seeing the United States, and you see this white light out on the horizon. Well. You saw that one first. That's the first order lens. And that's how simple this is. There's nothing fancy about the orders of lenses. There's no big scientific explanation for it. You see it first, when all of them are together, that's the first order lens. Sail a few miles closer and you will see the second order lens second. And until you get up within 10 miles of the coast, you won't see that sixth order at all because it's not putting out very much light. And there were reasons for having these various, various quantities of light. Uh, you, want, you wanted a big, powerful light when you were looking for something as big as the United States. You wanted a very teeny light that you could only see for a couple of miles when you were looking for the mouth of a river or looking for the end of the pier where you wanted to tie up your ship. So that's why, that's why there were all these different variations. And we can, we can get further into that if you want to uh, in, the, in the question and answer period. Next, the next big, does that make sense, Myron? Yes, thank you. Good, I'm glad, I'm very glad. The next thing let's talk about quickly is characteristics. Along with, along with these rotation speeds that, that we've got going here, um, they came up with some characteristics, and I'm not putting them all up here. There were a total of six vari variables originally. You have the fixed lens, and the fixed lens obviously doesn't, it doesn't rotate, but you have a fixed white light in here, and it sends out a disk of light 360 degrees around 
out to any horizon, just a disk of light. It's like a light bulb. It's just constantly burning, and you see a constant light. That's pretty simple stuff. That's one characteristic. When you get into flashing lenses, rotating lenses, they have to rotate to, to, to uh, flash. This is the smallest one, which is an eight flash panel. There's eight individual bullseyes around the, around the circumference of this lens. All the way up to a 24 flash panel. Keep in mind, all of the, these lenses are rotating at the speed of this guy right here. One revolution every eight to 10 minutes. So as, as this guy is going past your eye, you're only seeing a flash once a minute if, if it's rotating uh, at its proper speed. So it's, uh, it's not very good uh, because, because of this, this long disparity between the flashes. And we'll, we'll talk about flashing, flashing in a minute. Uh, with 24 flash panels, obviously there's three times more, more bullseyes than this one. So if you see this, a flash here every minute, you're gonna see a flash from this one every 20 seconds. And that's about as good as life got up until the, the, uh, the mercury float. Why were these things so slow? Well, they were so slow, we talked briefly about it last week, but let's talk about it again. Brunel's roller, Brunel's roller assembly, or the chariot assembly, as they, they became known, is the reason why. Friction, weight, all, all the, these basic characteristics of phys in physics that uh, all the physics students know more about than I do. This is Fresnel's first lens again. It's a big blow up of just the bottom of his lens. And you can see the chariot wheels. Okay, this is 1821. And this is what this great big lens up here is rotating on is this little table on these chariot wheels driven by a clockwork right here. Well, here's a lens from, oh, 1850, I believe, 1860, rolling on those same big chariot wheels and driven by a clockwork. Not much had changed. And this was the standard of the industry from 1821 to 1890. There was no variation in how they made these things rotate. They hadn't come up with the ball bearing yet. That was a later invention. And they hadn't come up with a mercury float yet. So this is what they had. So, so they were stuck with these, ver these, these characteristics. They only had six of them. Early in the country's development, six was adequate. You, you, could have, you, you could space out your lenses in such a way that you would see enough variable characteristics so that, so that you could identify the light you were looking at. Now keep in mind, too, that when all this development was going on, we're talking about sailing vessels. That's what's coming to the United States. That's what's going all around the world is sailing vessels. Sailing vessels are slow, and we're going to talk about that in a second, too. So that, that plays into it. As navigation gets, gets uh, bigger and faster, so, so do the lenses. They need to. What keeps this thing growing? Clockworks. Here's, here's a couple of clockwork assemblies. This is a colonial clockwork. Here's your cable spool. Here's the cable. There's a weight hanging at the end of this cable. You wind it up and lift the weight up to there, and you let it go, and it, it turns this chain, which is attached to a spit in a fireplace. And you put your big chunk of meat on that spit, and you let this thing do the work of turning it for you. The, the concepts of clockworks goes way, way back in history. It's, it's not a modern invention by any means. Over here on the right, this is a first order clockwork from a lighthouse lens. A little more complicated, it's got a few more gears and, and whirly gigs in it, but it's basically the exact same machine, and right there, the gray, the gray stuff is the cable that's wound around its cable drum, which goes out and down, drops straight down the lighthouse tower. And as that weight drops down the tower, it makes the lens go around. Simple stuff. They're just driven by a weight fallen, fallen down a tower thanks to gravity. That, that's, the, that's the basis of the whole thing. Well, that's good, but a few things happened. Like I said, when we had sailing vessels, sailing vessels are slow. You're plodding along through the water, and you don't need, uh, 
you don't need to go, you don't need a light flashing every couple of seconds because you're only moving a few feet, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a time period. So you see this light here, and you take, you take a fix. You, you see that light flash. You take a fix on that, and you start your stopwatch. All right, and it is ticking off and ticking off. And when you see the next flash, you, you click your stopwatch, and you say, oh, OK, 50 seconds. So then you go to your light list, which has been around forever, and the light list tells you what that time is. And it says, that's uh, uh, K Patteris light. Can't be any other light because the light list says so. And I know roughly where I am in the world. I may not know within a couple of miles of where I am, but, but I know closely where I am. So that's OK, now I have K Patteris. And then you look further down the coast, and you see another light flash. And you start doing it again with your stopwatch. And you figure out that that's uh, Body Island light. And you take angles, you take bearings to those two things that you were looking at. And where those two little lines converge, that's where you are in the water. That's how they did it. So three bearings are better than two, but two will, two will sort of tell you roughly where you are. Well, that's well and good when you're, when you're dealing with sail and wooden, wooden hulls. But let's, let's forward ourselves a little bit and talk about steel hulls, iron hulls, steam-driven vessels. These things move a lot, lot faster. When, as these guys are moving through the water, that fix every, every, uh, every flash every minute isn't going to tell you anything that's of value to you. You need to see flashes a lot quicker. You need to see a lot more uh, characteristic in, in the lights. So quicker lights were needed. And, that, uh, and that's where, <clears throat> that's part, part of what, what, what all the rationale was behind developing, fi finally develop, developing the mercury float. Along with that, the ports of the, of, the country, of the world were just getting filled with vessels. So rather than having one, one light every 10 miles down a coastline, suddenly you need to have a bunch more lights because you've got all this vessel traffic. You get traffic jams. People need to know where they are. They need to know where is that little pier that I'm looking for. There, there's a lot going on on the water, and uh, navigation is getting uh, more and more harried, let's say. So it became, uh, as ports become more crowded, the Lighthouse Service uh, in France realizes that the Mercury float will solve, solve these problems because they, they can rotate these things so easily up to six revolutions a minute and uh, get, get into some really nice characteristics that will help, help the ports tell people where they, where they are. So, Instead of uh, doing that one revolution every eight to 10 minutes, like this guy is doing here, uh, has it gone around yet once? Yeah. OK, good, good. It seems like they never go around. Uh, you're talking about one revolution every 10 seconds. So that, that's a monster, monster improvement. So these concepts were already being kicked around for quite a while. And so now we get to the solution. The father of the Mercury float is really not Augustin Fresnel, it's Léon Bordelais. He was the chief of the French Lighthouse Establishment uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, and he set about to make uh, Fresnel's suggestion a reality. And this is, his, his first mer this is the world's first Mercury float lens. It is, it's in a museum in France. Uh, this is the Mercury float here, the Mercury bowl, I'm sorry. And the float is on the inside of that. Uh, the design work was completed in 1890 by Bordelais. Then he worked with a famous French ma lens manufacturer, uh, Frederick Barbier. And it took them three years to actually make, make, make this machine and make it work. So it took, it took them a little while. But in 1893, this, this lens was installed at the lighthouse at Le Havre. On the big screen, you see two vessels. Um, one just has water in it. Let's see if I can wiggle this. It's just plain old water. Uh, the other vessel, which is corked, has our simulated mercury. Uh, it's actually gallium. Uh, we don't dare bring mercury into the room because 
Osher would just kill us for it. <laughs> um, Galling melts at uh, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so we literally hold it in a warm palm and we'll melt. Uh, we just warmed it up in a little uh, peating pad here. So you can see if I bump it, it it's actually liquid. We've got, uh, let's set this in here where you can see it, two cylinders um, of solid aluminum. And we're just going to, of course, everybody knows if you drop it in water, what's going to happen? Plum. <laughs> aluminum, drop it into the galleon, sure. floats. And a uh, similar principle. Cool, huh? With mercury. Yeah. Uh, it's just the uh, mercury is denser by factor 13.6. That density is five, I think, the mercury's thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. So almost three. Go ahead and pull this out. <coughs> and we'll have uh, something to show you later on this bread that an interesting observation that we made. That's it. Thanks, Warren. Perfect. Perfect. So basically that's how they work. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Now, now you're going to see a lot of photographs uh, through, throughout the, the rest of this presentation uh, that deal with this particular lens. Uh, this lens was at White Shoal Light uh, on your handy map in Michigan. White Shoal is right there. Okay. Uh, this is a cross section. This is the actual builder's drawing of it, uh, RBA's drawing. And this, this little shape right here is, is called the bowl. Uh, think of it as a soup bowl uh, or a cereal bowl. That's the easiest way to describe it to people. This is the float. So this is, what, this is the casting that floats inside of, of this casting. And what does it float on? See this little teeny space here on both sides? That's the mercury. In this lens, that mercury is an eighth of an inch wide. That's all it is. That's all it takes to float, to float oh, a couple of thousand pounds of, of lens above it. So it's pretty cool, pretty darn cool stuff. Uh, there's very little friction in these things. Uh, when, I, when I flipped this, I took this lens out of the lighthouse in 1983, and when I flipped that switch, the lens rotated on its own for three minutes and 33 seconds before it stopped. So that, that's how virtually friction-free the, the mercury bearing is. It's really cool, and it would have probably gone a lot longer, but there's a, also a small uh, ball bearing system that's built into it to keep it, just to keep it centered. And probably more of the friction on those ball bearings is what slowed it down so fast. It may have gone six to 10 minutes, who knows? So here's a picture of that. And again, here is the bowl. And here is the float assembly. And you can, you can just barely see it. I, I, it's, this slide is probably not that good. But all, all of this dark stuff in here is, is the mercury. And it rides about this far up the side of that float when the float is lowered into the bowl. And to make it all work, you have, you have, to, you have to lower this in on this great big screw. And then you put a pin in through this casting, and uh, it locks it to that shaft. Otherwise, it won't work. So any, any mechanical engineers in here, that's, that's, that's just to answer your question before you ask it. <coughs> so uh, it's pretty simple. This is not in the lighthouse. Uh, uh, this is actually in, in the museum where this lens is today. and. Uh, and uh, the reason we're all suited up is because we're taking the mercury out of it for the second time because they, people at the, at the museum thought it would be a good idea to rotate this thing on its original bearing. And then they had a little spill, and it got, got complicated. And they decided, let's take the mercury back out of it again. So they did. And that's what we're doing there. So anyway, finally, the US buys this concept. Uh, in 1893, when the first one went into production in, the United, in uh, France, the US was right behind them buying, buying their first two in 1893 as well, because, because they saw, they did see the, uh, the need for this. And uh, 
This is the, the uh, lens from Cape Henry Lighthouse. This is a mercury float. Uh, you, you say, well, where's the mercury? Well, the mercury is really down in a tub down here. And it all, it all, all the force is transmitted through this drive shaft. But here's your, here's your clockwork assembly. This lens, you can see these really odd flash panels. Uh, very strange looking things if, you, if you're thinking about the circular flash panels because, because these are semi-circular flash panels. But this lens rotated at such a speed that you got a flash from one of these panels every three and a half seconds. Not bad because this is a first order lens. It's six feet across here. There's a lot of weight up here. And this whole thing is spinning around like a little whirly gig. It's really, really cool stuff. There were a lot more variations of this. Um, and and as, they got, as they figured out that, that they needed more characteristics and odd characteristics, they just went nuts. I mean, you, you know how we are with speed and faster is better and all of that sort of stuff. Well, that's not a new concept. We did not invent it. The world has been doing this for a long time. Faster is better. Something different is better. And uh, maybe it's true, at least sometimes, but I don't know that it's always true. So here's a few variations on, on the theme. Uh, this, this is a first order lens, so remember it's about, it's about six feet across on the inside. But notice the flash panels. These are double flash panels. So now you have a lens that's turning very, very quickly, floating in this bowl of mercury, and now you have, instead of one flash panel, you have two flash panels that go by your eyes, so you see bing, bing, like that. They had them with three flash panels that were all stuck together, so you would see bing, 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 or bing, 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 rather, and then you would see an eclipse. You would see nothing. Uh, as, uh, as this part of the glass goes by, all of this glass here, you see nothing. You don't see a flash, you don't see a light. It becomes invisible to, to, a, to the sailor. And then it comes around, you'll see another bing, bing, or bing, bing, bing. And that's how these things uh, came up with these crazy characteristics. This lens is about six feet in diameter and overall height about 18 feet for, for the machine. This is a hyperradial lens. This is the biggest lens that, that was ever built in the world. Uh, the US only owns one of these. This is about eight foot, eight, eight and a half feet in diameter, give or take a, a little bit. The machine itself is about 24 feet tall. And here's the guy. You, you can just see him working on the lamp there. So, so that gives you kind of an idea of the scale of that lens. They're, they're phenomenal, phenomenal machines. Uh, a few more variations on this. Here, here's a great one. I love this. This, this. this is not anything that was ever used by the US, but the British loved them. Uh, it's a stacked first order lens. So what, what do we have here? We have a lens that's six feet back to back of the bullseyes, or it's about eight feet across the diagonal. Uh, these are six feet in diameter. And uh, instead of the brilliance of one flash panel, like, like is, is common, you actually have two that are stacked one above the other. So you, when that goes by your eye, you see a light that's twice as bright as a, as a conventional lens. So you see this really bright flash on the horizon. That's, that's what these guys would give you. And this lens, believe it or not, is, uh, like I said, it's eight feet across, across this width here, which is the diagonal. And it's, again, about 20 feet tall. The most complicated lens I know of in the world is this guy here. This is a double hyperradial lens. This is actually two separate lenses on the same platen rotating around together, give, giving you this really odd flash characteristic. This is a British lens. And uh, here's, here's the little clockwork driving it down here. No, we still haven't gotten to electric motors. I mean, look at the guy in, in this phenomenal machine. This thing is, give or take, 14 feet across and about 30 feet tall. 
And uh, as far as I know, that's the biggest lens that was ever, ever built. Pretty phenomenal stuff. Well, the little guy in the middle, what's he? That's a fourth order lens. This is a US lens. This is at Cape May, New Jersey on display at the uh, Coast Guard Training Center. This is also a mercury float. This, this is only 19 inches across and about six feet tall. But same concept, there was a clockwork in this little glass case here, and it, turn, it turned in this mercury, mercury float assembly. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on this next slide. These were great, great machines, but they had, did have some drawbacks. Uh, they were very expensive to buy. They cost about three times as much to buy as a conventional lens. Just for that, that mercury float assembly was, was a very complicated machine, uh, required a lot of machining, a lot of very, very close tolerances. Those chariot wheels could be off by a little bit, but, but the mercury assembly could not be. So the tolerances were very close. Uh, because of those different characteristics that everybody wanted, tr uh, double or triple quick flashers, uh, then you got into grinding some very unusual pieces of glass. And so here's, here's an order for one lens with a triple flash quick flash characteristic. We're gonna build that lens for you and we may never get another order for that lens. So we're gonna throw all those molds away, we're gonna throw all those machines away that, that were built just to grind those particular pieces of glass. So these got to be very, very expensive machines. Well, if you know anything about the US Lighthouse Service, one, one of its great claims to fame is it was one of the cheapest organizations in the world. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that in a bad way. They were frugal. They were frugal with the taxpayer's dollar. And uh, so the, these were really cute, but the, they, they weren't so impressed with the, with, the, uh, with the invoice when it showed up, let's say. Uh, and at the end, we already had too many lights. They arrived on scene too late. Uh, they, they didn't show up till 1893. In 1850, the U.S. had about 300 lighthouses. By 1910, we had 1,400 lighthouses. Well, we had built just about all the lighthouses we were gonna use in this country by then. We didn't need to buy more mercury float lenses because the demand for lighthouses wasn't there. Uh, my records indicate that, that overall the U.S. bought about 40 mercury float lenses and used them around, around the country. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the Lighthouse Service did love the concept. And so, uh, we'll just go back one. The, this mercury float assembly here was built by the U.S. Lighthouse Service at uh, the Tompkinsville Depot on Staten Island, New York, and they made a lot of these. And they converted uh, conventional uh, U.S. rotating uh, lights that, that rotated on, on rollers to mercury floats. They're, they're, they made a whole bunch of these. I haven't found the record yet that tells me how many they made, but I'm, I'm always amazed. I keep running into them in museums. So they made a bunch of them. So there's, it's not that they didn't like the concept, they just didn't like the expense. Uh, the lens in the photo here <clears throat> is the second to the last mercury float lens that the U.S. bought. It's a Kilauea, it's a second order lens in Hawaii. Uh, I don't have a picture of the last one that we bought, but, but this is darn close to it. Lighthouse automation comes along. They, they, these are great machines, and they operate uh, relatively maintenance-free, other than clean, uh, cleaning out mercury once in a while was a problem, but, but that's about all you had to do. But the automation program really doomed these uh, because they did require, if you're gonna take the people off, you don't have anybody there that's gonna wind up that clockwork assembly, so the weight can drop down the tower. And of course, by the, autom day, the days of automation, we had already switched all of these to electric motor drives. And the lighthouses, because they had people on board, had all kinds of electric power available to them because they had generators that were running 24 hours a day, burning, I don't know, one or two gallons an hour, uh, making electricity for everybody. So it was no big deal to have a big, big, herky electric motor on one of these guys just driving it 
and, uh, and turning it. Actually, uh, at least on the Great Lakes, they never turned them off. They never turned these things off. They let them run 24 hours a day. It was cheaper to, than, than letting them slow, stop and, and because getting them started was, it was sometimes a bit of a trick. But as we, wrote, as we automate the lighthouses and we take the people off, then we solarize them and we take the electricity away. Well, when you do that, this becomes a fixed light no matter how many characteristics it's got, and that's not so good. So that's, that's when I really got into uh, uh, removing a lot of these guys. I'm gonna take a little side trip here. Uh, it'll, it'll all fit in, <clears throat> you'll understand in a minute. Although you'll think, what the heck is he talking about? Uh, there, were all, there were on occasion structural issues associated with, with, with these things, and, and, and the premier structural issue that I know of uh, is this. Again, this is that white shoal light on your handy map of Michigan's right there, and those other, those other lens pictures of the, of the green lens, so that's the white shoal lens. This lighthouse was built in 1907. It was the marvel of the day. The uh, tower is all glazed white tile. It was really a phenomenal uh, structure. It would glisten in the sun because, because of the glazed tile. It wasn't just a brick structure or a stone structure. It was very, very unique. And one of a kind, it had a aluminum lantern room. Now lantern rooms are usually cast iron, uh, rarely bronze but this was a one of a kind. Aluminum had just, just really hit the scene around the turn of the century, maybe a little bit before, when they, when they figured out how to smelt the bauxite to get the aluminum out of the ore. And so aluminum was, was this wonderful new metal that really didn't have any uses yet. And they were, they were trying to figure out what to, what to do with it. They hadn't come up with beer cans. So, you know, <laughs> what else do you do with aluminum? <clears throat> So uh, anyway, the Lighthouse Service said, hey, this is really cool stuff. Let's build an aluminum lantern room. It'll be maintenance free. We won't have to paint it. It'll be really gorgeous. It'll be glistening in the sunlight. It's gonna be all these wonderful things. So they did. They built a totally solid aluminum lantern at the cost of $17,500. Now for the Lighthouse Service, that's a lot of money. Believe me, in 1907, that's a phenomenal quantity of money. And that's just for the lantern room. It's not for the lighthouse that holds it up with its glazed tile. They, they must have had a big budget in 1907. The lens, the beautiful, beautiful lens that went inside of it cost $12,500. So we're talking about a $35,000 investment just right there on the, for this lighthouse. That's, uh, that's a big investment. 1983 comes along and I get my travel orders and they say go up and take the lens out of, out of White Shoals so that we can finish the automation program on that particular lighthouse. So I did and because I worked in environmental compliance I was also certified to work on uh, in hazardous waste and all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> Although I, I, I will admit I was a little light on my knowledge about some of, some of the health health related problems with mercury at the time. Uh, I've learned a lot since then. <clears throat> but we took the lens out and then we started looking around. This photograph right here is right at the base of the lens, the lens pedestal. This, this is the pedestal of the lens. And in the process of pulling things apart, uh, broke, broke loose obviously a bunch of paint. And you see that shiny stuff? Well, that's mercury. Mercury laying on the deck uh, under the lens. It actually had been painted over numerous times because Coasties paint, paint over everything. And uh, it was just sitting there emitting vapors for the guys to breathe every, all day, every day. Great stuff. Uh, <clears throat> well, remember oh, on the second or slide or so, I mentioned that that mercury uh, is an amalgam, and it has a real affinity for aluminum. Hmm. Uh, our first clue should have been, and, and we didn't even connect this, uh, my, my photographer that
I'm set up his tripod, just like, like pretty much what that guy's camera is sitting on right there in the corner. And, uh, and his aluminum tripod is sitting in the lantern room, and he's taking pictures, and, and everything's great. And his tripod, tripod starts to grow these little white feathers. And I'm not kidding. It's growing white feathers that are growing out from the tripod. Very strange looking little things. And, uh, and we never, we, at the time, we did not connect the, there was so much mercury vapor in that lantern room that it was eating his tripod. And that's what it was doing. Well, the mercury vapor was literally eating his tripod. <clears throat> but as we, uh, as we got done with, with the, uh, the removal of the, the lens, then we, I really started looking around the, the lantern room and took the kick plate off you can just barely see one of the screw holes there that held the kick plate on that went around the outside of the lantern room right, right at the, this level here. And this is what I found underneath it. The, the, this is steel liner, which is fine because steel isn't really affected by mercury very much. But underneath, this is the aluminum lantern. Well, this ch chunk that fell off here used to be aluminum. Now it's an aluminum powder. And this bluish, grayish stuff underneath that is, mercury, is, is aluminum that's being eaten by the mercury vapors. So given enough time uh, in a high wind that if they'd left that, that lens in place in that particular lantern room, uh, the, whole, the whole thing would have gotten underway in, in, a, in a strong enough wind because there wouldn't be anything holding that lantern together anymore. Uh, dangerous, dangerous stuff. <clears throat> So luckily, that was the only aluminum lantern that the, that the Lighthouse Service ever used because they were so darned expensive. And it's probably a good thing. Along with all of this, there is, I, 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 would, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, that there are some health issues related with mercury, as, as Brad mentioned. OSHA would not be happy if, if he brought in a beaker of the stuff. Uh, in 1972, there was a Coast Guard maintenance team in New England working on a lighthouse, and it had a mercury float lens in it. And these guys were electricians and, and that sort of thing, and they, they didn't know anything about mercury any more than I did in 1983. So they're working away, and they got everything all opened up, and it's a really super hot day, and mercury loves to cook vapors off uh, the hotter it gets. And these guys are all inhaling this stuff, and they all, they all report the, the same symptoms when they get back to their base. And they're really sick, actually. So they send them to the hospital, and <clears throat> they do a little testing on them, and they find out that they all have mercury poisoning. So the commandant of the Coast Guard, the top dog in Washington, says, hmm, that's not so good, is it? We're doing that to our people. So he writes an order right away, or, or fairly quickly anyway, for the Coast Guard, that all mercury float lenses will be retired from service, wh whether they had electric power there to keep them rolling or not. Well, the photograph in this, in this uh, slide is, that's me in there, in, in, 19, in 2004. And I'm draining the mercury out of the Point Arena lens, which was the last lens on the Coast Guard inventory to still have mercury in it. So it really took 32 years from the time the commandant said to, to stop using them to making it a complete reality. So that, that's, that's the speed of the government. Uh, worldwide, uh, the Canadians have finally gotten out of the business. The Canadians had a lot more than we ever did. They, they, they just loved the concept of mercury flow lenses. They had a total of 214 in service. Uh, around the country. We only, we only, like I said, bought 40 of them. So, so they really went great guns on the mercury floats. The English in general uh, uh, are still in the business. They've gotten rid of mo most of them, but they still see the, the need for a few of them. So they, they, uh, they operate a, a, a few. The Australians are done with it. Most of the world is done with it because of the hazards involved. Uh, today, uh, I've conver I converted a lighthouse in, in Bermuda at Gibbs Hill uh, from a mercury float system to a ball bearing system, so it can be done. You just take the mercury out and you put a ball bearing system in the, in the bowl and uh, you have to change a few things around, but, but you can make those work. Uh, 
So that's really all of that. And I just want to talk, since I have a couple of minutes on my clock, anyway, uh, that Matt, Matt is a hatter thing. Uh, everybody knows Matt is a hatter uh, from, from Alice in Wonderland. Well, why do matter, hatters go mad? Well, it's pretty simple stuff. Back, back when hatters were making felt hats, the, the big top hats, the 1840s, 1850s, when they were really in vogue, they used beaver felt, beaver fur to do this. Well, if you, if you ever see a fiber of beaver fur, or just one hair, the stuff is stiff as a wire. You cannot bend it, no matter what you do. You, you can bend it all day, but it's going to spring back straight. And that's kind of a problem when you want to shape it into a hat. But what they figured out was if you, if you expose those fibers to mercury vapor, those fibers go completely limp. And you can do anything that you want to with them. So they would take, take the fibers, expose them to days and days of mercury, mercury vapor. Then they would take all these hairs, and they would, they would lay them on a table, and they would press them together and make what they called felt. And it was not, it's kind of like uh, uh, material fiberglass, because all these fibers are going in different directions and stacking up and really getting pretty strong. It's, you have this very limp material. You spread it over your hat form. You shape your hat. You take it out of the room that's got the mercury vapor in it, let it set up, and voila, you have a hat that will keep its shape forever. Well, the problem was those guys were breathing this stuff 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And one of, one of the things that mercury will do to you is eat your brain. And that's what happened with these guys. And that, that's the mad as a hatter is a real thing. It's not just Alice in Wonderland. So we got it in. And thank you very much. You've been a great, great audience as, again. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan. By the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment. And by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible in part by Pfizer. Pfizer.